This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 626, recorded on June 12th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. Welcome back. How have you been? Yep. Have, you, have you been fishing this week? Nope. Aww. Been tying flies. I see them on the desk behind you. Yep. Very nice. Thank you. So joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no tying flies here, just uh, doing experiments. Right. From Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 87 degrees, headed for 91, sunny skies. It's a gorgeous day, gorgeous day. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. I am neither flying nor tying, but it is uh, 20, <laughs> 29 Celsius. The dew point is 8 Celsius, so very low humidity. And beautiful, beautiful blue skies, a few puffy clouds. It's just lovely. Pretty yes. much exactly how it is here. Good. So, and same here. Looks good here. Um, Dixon, I can see your house from my office here. I'm in New yes, York. Yes, you can. Yes, I'm you here can. in New York City. All right. Our, guest, to you. our <laughs> guest today is back. He's been here like three times in the last couple of months from the University of North Carolina, Ralph Barrick. Hello. Hey, Vincent. It's a pleasure to be here. Carolina Blue Skies, another uh, day in paradise in North Carolina. Uh, I wish I was fishing on the sound, um, but I'm not. Maybe maybe next week. I didn't know you fished. So, Ralph, you see you got a new uh, uh, NASCAR iteration. What do you think of that? <laughs> what does that mean? The new NASCAR regulations. They eliminated the use of the Confederate flag. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I was, they, I was just <laughs> and what happened was one of the drivers just up and quit. Only yeah, one. I saw that on the news yesterday. Only one well. quit. Right. I want to remind everyone that um, there are ASV virtual workshops. What is it? Next week, right? Next yeah. week. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to be here recording next week because I'm going to go to the Pox workshop. I'm also going to be going to workshops next week. It looks like it's me and you, Alan. I think it's just us. Yes. We can handle I'll be it. Here. Right? We'll probably figure something. Oh, Dixon will be here. Cool. You Dixon, and Dixon. Great. No, I'm not going to be here Monday and Tuesday, but I'll be here the other day. No, Friday is okay. all, is Friday. all we need. June, Friday's fine. June 15th through 19th. These are ASV virtual workshops that have been put together by Stephanie Karst, Andrea Garcia, and others. And these are normally that would have been presented abstracts that would have been presented. <coughs> they're going to be uh, done virtually. I presume it's zoom, right? Um, I think most so. Of them are zoom. And you can go, you don't have to be an ASV member. You don't, it's free, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, I'll put the link in the show notes, but it's asv.org slash virtual dash workshops. And you should uh, register this weekend, right? Beforehand. Yes, you should register beforehand. Um, some of them have uh, caps, and so you want to make sure you get your spot. Okay. So uh, you're going to go all week, Brianne? Is that the plan? Um, I will be at some of them um, just about every day, yeah. All right. Um, I'm moderating three of them and will be oh. at a few others. Cool. Very good. You're going to be busy. A little bit. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> busy is good. <laughs> Busy is good. <laughs> Here at Microbe TV, we condemn violence of any kind and will commit resources as an educational platform to support the African American community and people of color worldwide. Black Lives Matter, and our hearts, our support, and our solidarity are with everyone who suffers from racial injustice. Human dignity starts with the singular premise that we are all the same no matter our skin color, religion, sex, gender, or where we live. At all times and in all circumstances, people are entitled to respect and humane treatment, especially by those in positions of authority. Microbe TV says no more racism, and we will work with educators, scientists, and civil society globally to do what is in our power to end social just injustice in all its forms. Well, here, here. well said. You know, it's, it's great to hear it, but it's a shame we have to say it, isn't it? Sure. It's, it should be a, a birthright. 
And have, so we will. The moment you're born, you should be ingrained with that. Well, and, I, and I do, I say that on behalf of everyone. Of course. Of here, of yes. course. And uh, this will be repeated on every one of our podcasts for the, for the next, I don't know how long, a while. Forever. Uh, you do it forever. Yep. Yep. Forever. Because okay. it's true forever. Well, t- till we no longer need to. So that's going to be a while. Yeah, it'll yeah. <laughs> yeah. be forever. Uh, that's right. That's right. Be nice if that weren't forever. All right, Ralph, uh, let's talk. We have, a, I have a bunch of your um, preprints queued up here. You've been very productive lately. And so we're going to talk about them. But uh, right now. It's almost as if there's a lot to do in your field, Ralph. Amazing. It's almost like you're busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So well, it's all uh, good stuff, Ralph. Yes. It's all good stuff. We are. In a situation where globally ca- case numbers are still going up, I just looked at the Hopkins website. The cur- right. daily cases are still rising. Here in the U.S., it depends where you are. You know, in New York, here we went through pretty bad time, and we are dropping. Although there's still cases here in the city, but other parts in the U.S. are on the rise. Uh, what's your assessment of all this, Ralph? Well, certainly, cases in North Carolina are on the rise. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, the 50 experiments that are going on um, <laughs> in terms of opening up society uh, and the workforce um, are, um, in some cases, uh, reinforcing predictions that were made by epidemiologists and modelers that uh, this would rise, result in a rise in cases. Yeah. Um, probably the really tragic area of the world, though, is um, in the Southern Hemisphere, South America, where uh, the number of cases are exploding in Brazil and Ecuador, Ecuador and Peru, um, and when you think about the um, both the public health infrastructures and the uh, hospital capacities and the availability of uh, um, state-of-the-art clinical care facilities in sufficient bu- abundance to handle the population there, I think we're going to see a, a truly tragic. Uh, outcome of epic proportions over the next few months. That would be my prediction. Yeah, Brazil is now number two in total global cases. Right. They they actually their um, federal government started to tried to suppress the numbers, tried to take them offline. I think they're now back online. There was there was an active effort to suppress the data because it looked so bad. Um, but yeah, that's not going to change the case counts. <laughs> A very unfortunate common occurrence that has occurred in many nations around the world. Yes. Uh, you guys are familiar with. And, and, uh, and some states within our own nation have. Um, that's correct. In similar types of behavior. That's correct. Uh, you guys are familiar with the uh, Brazil's uh, own version of poverty in the form of favelas. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And uh, I just, it's hard for me to imagine what the situation is like in those areas. It, it, it's got to be terrible. Agreed. Ralph, at some point we'll have vaccines, maybe next year. Are these going to be available to these countries that really need them? Brazil and South America, Africa? I know you don't know, but what do you think? Well, I think well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it from a positive perspective. Um, so, I think this is an extraordinary opportunity for uh, humanity to rapidly uh, develop a portfolio that allows you to rapidly move vaccines from preclinical testing into human trials. And um, I think the NIH is doing a superb job of, uh, in parallel testing to the best of their ability, the preclinical animal models. both in small and large animal models and also the phase one trials that are being done in parallel to try to glean sufficient data to uh, open up large uh, phase two trials that involve uh, maybe 20 to 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, an extraordinary effort. It's a new paradigm. And um, to some extent, it's probably the paradigm that needs to be developed for pandemic preparedness against respiratory viruses. So those are all good things. Uh, whether we'll have a vaccine available in the spring is going to depend on a variety of factors. Um, I think that one of the vaccines, at least, that is going through the pipeline will probably prove efficacious. 
Uh, and so uh, the other thing that nations around the world are doing is that they are in, um, in real time purchasing vaccines on candidates that they don't have proof are, that are going to work. And so I think the U.S. is already planning to purchase 300 million doses of at least one or two vaccines. And that's a very aggressive posture. Um, so I, it, I will say in terms of uh, availability for the world, um, you know, sadly, the greatest risk factor for COVID-19 infection is uh, poverty. Wealth is the greatest uh, <laughs> factor that prevents you from getting infected. Yeah, yeah. And so most likely those vaccines, um, you know, will probably be applied initially to uh, the wealthier nations of the world that actually develop them. And there will be a strong effort to get them as as you know, as many vaccine doses as they can to the rest of the world. Um, I don't know how well they're going to do. Uh, they're clearly not even going to have enough vaccines probably for everyone in the U S uh, or Europe or uh, Asia, um, certainly not South or Central Alpha, South Central America or uh, Africa. So hopefully someone is thinking about um, developing a strategy of uh, applying the vaccines to maximize the impact on transmission. And, and we should point out that these are not new problems that we couldn't have seen coming. I mean, I, I know correct. probably everybody in this group, certainly I've sat through entire meetings talking about emerging infectious diseases and uh, tropical diseases and neglected diseases. And these these problems, the inverse correlation between infection and wealth, the problem of distributing enough of whatever it is, whether it's HIV drugs or a vaccine to um, to poor countries, this is... You know, we've, we've been not solving this problem for decades or these problems for decades. And right. now we finally, to get back to your, your positive take on it, which I like a lot, this is an opportunity to get it right, to, to go through it and say, okay, we're going to actually, you know, address this problem on a global scale and maybe right. make that the paradigm for doing this sort of thing in the future. I certainly so hope so. I hope so. Yes. Yeah, certainly in the U.S., you know, one of the things we really need to be doing is doing a better tracking of um, where are the vulnerable nodes of transmission and who is most vulnerable to transmit to the maximal number of people. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about uh, um, distributing vaccine, well, obviously, healthcare workers become a major priority. But then uh, then you have individuals in um closed settings like nursing homes and critical care facilities, uh, workers in uh, high density manufacturing cap capacities, um, people that work on grocery lines and, and who do hair. I mean, these people might be much, the, the impact in terms of reducing disease uh, could be significantly more um, beneficial if we think carefully about uh, which populations need to be prioritized uh, to maximize the impact on transmission. And I don't know how well that's been studied. And I, I think it's a sort of a critical area of public health that needs to be um, majorly supported. I'm reminded that uh, Brazil, actually, I don't know whether this is uh, still possible or applies, but they actually invented the concept of a national vaccination day. That's right. Uh, and have put this into practice a couple of times, I think, with polio, right, where they yeah, yeah. Uh, they appropriately advertise it. And, of course, it depends on having enough vaccine available. Yeah. But on one day, they vaccinate everybody in the country. Yeah, right? I think yeah. that that began in Brazil and then was exported to a number of other countries, including India, Pakistan, where they do these national immunization days. And it, it has been... Uh, well, Vincent can take it from there. It's been kind of the right. backbone of the yeah. end stage of the global global polio eradication effort. Now, Saban went to to Brazil uh, when um, when he was developing his vaccine and um, showed that you could do these national immunization days. They welcomed him and showed you know they'd always had a the vaccine had been licensed and there was always this this level of polio still. And he said, if we if we vaccinate everyone, we're going to interrupt it. And twice a year, and went down, and that was the basis for WHO later saying 
we can eradicate by doing these things. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I wonder how that would go over in the U.S. Hmm. National Immunization Day? Yeah. You're going to have a whole bunch of people saying, uh, you're encroaching on my uh, personal <laughs> rights. I don't True. <laughs> That's right. But I think I think the key there is in in the in the scenario like that you have um you have prepared beforehand you have significant su sufficient vaccine doses to make a difference. In this case we're trying to vaccinate what 5.4 or 5 4.9 billion people to get to 70% herd immunity. Right. Uh that's not going to happen. Right. So um there's a way to do this smartly to maximize impact. And, um, and that needs to be carefully considered. And I, ho I hope to hear, you know, and see papers talking about here are the critical nodes for transmission that if we break, we will maximize um, the public health benefit of the vaccine. So the, uh, the, the paradigm for this in the past has been HIV. Everybody thought a vaccine was the right approach, but right now we've got triple therapy that seems to be working very well. And the vaccines failed almost every time it's been tried. So do you have any hope for the development of a similar development out of the blue comes a drug or a series of drugs that can be used to stem an epidemic and its tracks? Well, let's, so let's break them into three categories. There's the direct acting antivirals. There's the repurposed drugs that are basically targeting host uh, biosynthetic pathways right. and signaling networks. And then you have the third, which I, probably is a direct acting antiviral, but it's an antibody against the virus, kind of yep. a different class. Yep. Yep. So um, there's good evidence that combinations of antibodies and direct acting antivirals that affect replication are, will, will probably have a pretty good impact. Um, the work with Ebola argued um, fairly um, convincingly that antibodies by themselves, a therapeutic antibody cocktail, could knock down mortality rates from about 70% to 30%, 35%. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a little bit of a different disease since it's occurring at the interface of oxygen exchange. Oh. And uh, you have the possibility of coagulopathies throwing clots to cause heart attacks or strokes. Sure. Um, and that's a little bit different. So, uh, in terms of the pathophysiology of the disease, um, so I don't know. You know, we're we're in a, a new learning environment in terms of how to treat this virus, right. and uh, single therapies uh, probably won't be the answer. It will be some kind of combination therapy. Uh, the problem I have with the host targeted therapies is that you hear. Mm, good arguments for why these things should work, but they rarely talk about the pathways that get activated uh, that are critical for control of viral pathogenesis, things like things like JAK Jack inhibitors, kind of ignoring JAK stack pathways and the importance of ISGs in controlling viral infection. So um, we'll see how that goes. Um, probably the most important um, development that um, the community needs is a robust small animal model of disease that has lethal outcomes so that we can begin to test these uh, three categories of, of antivirals in a systematic way. And um, we've been working pretty hard on that. Just before we go on, just, just out, Texas, Florida, and California have just reported their high, highest daily tallies of new cases. Yep. There you go, yep. Rich. Be careful, Rich. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I you, uh, I don't know, but uh, I'm attributing this the onset of this to Memorial Day. Could be. We're now just like two weeks from Memorial right. Day when Texas went nuts. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's true. You said Florida was the other case, the other yeah. state. Florida, yeah. Texas, and, 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 and California. Yeah, uh, Florida ignores a lot of cases too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh. Um, two two short things before we. Uh, talk about your papers, including your mouse model. Um, have the transmission modes changed in your view since we talked last? It was mainly droplet. I'm, we're hearing, uh, you know, aerosol is a possibility. Of course, contact. What do you think about this? Well, there's no question. Direct um, uh, fomite transmission is probably real. Large droplet definitely is real. 
I have been a fan of uh, small droplet spread aerosol spread uh, in certain individuals, especially these the this, this super this this the sort of the super spreader category. Uh, and it turns out there are, uh, from what I, when I talk to uh, pul pulmonary specialists, sorry, I come I, I was from South Jersey, so sometimes I have trouble pronouncing things. <laughs> 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 it's not because of the education. <laughs> it's, it's okay. I'm from northern New Jersey. I <laughs> right. two, two thirds of the board just heard it. Yeah. Those people from New Jersey, you got to keep yeah. an eye on them. You know, just, well, you know. <laughs> hey, yeah, Brienne, yeah. how do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. She's from New York I, State. She's from New I'm York. from New York State, but I don't know that I really want too many of my students to hear me say anything bad about Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> we got four people here on the air. There's five from New Jersey. I'm from the southern part of the state, so it's an all so farm country. One, huh? Vince, for sure, Burrietta, yeah. and myself. Yeah. yeah. That's it's a, a great of, state. That's a lot of Jerseyites. I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> pulmonary okay. specialist. Oh, yeah. That's another characteristic of New Jersey, by the way. <laughs> you know, who, who say that um, uh, sort of the, the physiology of the, the upper airway and, um, and um, indicate that some individuals are. Uh, basically prone to produce a large number of small particles mm. when they breathe. And so um, those individuals might be super spreaders. I don't know. I like the, th the hypothesis. I'd like to, to be able to be in, in a position to explore it scientifically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then again, I don't know anything about it. So <laughs> it'd be a perfect topic for me just to jump right on it. Uh, I want to, I want to, <laughs> Is that not how you're supposed to do science? <laughs> yeah, I kind of, you know, yeah, dive in head first, close your eyes because, hey, you know, so it could only be a rock under there. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I want to be clear here that uh, my understanding is that there's there's not actually been any changes in transmission of the virus. If anything is changing, it's our understanding mm -hmm. sure. of what the yes. of what the transmission is, and and I think this is something that a lot of people don't understand with with many aspects of this pandemic. Uh, things seem to change, uh, but really we're learning. Okay, this mm. is a this is new territory, sure. and we're learning. And it's important to give people a break and let yeah. them say, "Oh, I got that wrong." Now we understand something new. We're going to the change roaches did not suddenly appear in the kitchen when you turned on the light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There so an, are you there at are all worried about? There will be no place to test the vaccine when it's ready because by that time, the epidemic aspect of this will have died down and you've got little pockets spreading up every now and then. Where do you actually do your field testing? So typically, at least historically, when uh, new respiratory viruses sweep through a population, you may have 30% of the population. Um, the attack rate's around 30%. So uh, that's probably what we would see in the first year. Okay. A second year would be another thirty percent, and then there would would be a hopes, you know, hopefully sufficient herd immunity yeah. that the um, the next uh, year or two of uh, a disease outbreak would be much reduced until all the adults have been infected and are immune, and uh, the disease becomes a childhood illness. Now, right, right. That's uh, kind of the best case scenario. So, uh, unless the vaccine I mean, is short lived in terms of the immunity that it induces. Absolutely, that is one of the biggest concerns for the vaccine is the durability of the um, of the uh, certainly the neutralizing antibody response or the T cell response, uh, probably much longer. But the, there's some data that argues that neutralizing responses might be falling off quite rapidly in some individuals, and so that needs to be looked at very carefully over the next few months to see what natural infections do, and that's actually very typical for respiratory viruses. Mm -hmm. um, for the antibody response to wane. And it's probably typical of the common uh, contemporary human coronaviruses. So people are going to get reinfected. It's just a question of, is, is it a, in your reinfection, are you having uh, an upper respiratory tract infection mm -hmm. that's predominantly localized in your nose versus a lower respiratory tract infection where you're fighting for your life? And I'm not too concerned about the upper respiratory tract sniffles. But, uh, I would agree. I would well, agree. and the other the other issue is um, as the immunity wanes, to what extent can you spread the virus? Right. right. So right. Th th this is actually something I wanted to ask you about. So there have been a limited number of antibody studies in people so far, very few numbers. And 
the authors are, appear to be surprised that a good fraction of people are not making neutralizing antibodies, at least as the way they're measuring them. So, uh, so, so we we have a neutralizing assay in our lab where we've engineered SARS two to encode nanoluciferase. Mm -hmm. So it's a high throughput assay, about four logs of um, the phenotypic windows, about four logs, so you can get a really nice newt curves. And we also see 15, 20 percent of the people don't seem to mount much of an antibody neutralizing mm. response. But they've recovered, right? And they have recovered. And we also see other individuals who mount a really good neutralizing response, but then the second time point, about a month later, they've lost most of it. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're an outbred population. And so we're going to have people that are going to fall into all different categories. And that's going to be really important for vaccine design. Um, if a vaccine is being delivered by an intranasal route, that may actually recapitulate exactly what we see with this virus in humans. Mm. And if it's parenteral, you know, through a, uh, a sub-Q inoculation, um, that may be actual, actually a much better approach. Ah, it's interesting. So in fact, some of the uh, animal studies that have been done so far suggest that most of the animals respond after IM immunization, right? That's right. Hmm. Interesting. So do we, do we, uh, there's a lot of conversation here about the antibody response. Do we have uh, any idea what the relationship is between serum antibodies and functional immunity? No. Uh, I mean, just <laughs> if, the, if the antibody response wanes, it doesn't so necessarily, South Jersey response. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean you're susceptible, right? And I, I was actually going to going to ask a related question: To what extent do we understand the the cellular response, the T cell response that's happening in this? Uh, Alex Setti's group did a published a really nice paper in Cell about that, and um, mm. so we're starting to learn. Yeah. You know, that's still acute only. We have no idea about durability. Right. You know, again, if there was ever an argument for peer review at the National Institute of Health to, to ensure the support of understanding basic human virology and immunology for every virus family, uh, the coronaviruses are a good example of that. We know absolutely or nearly nothing. I don't want to say absolutely nothing, but nearly nothing about how uh, human contemporary coronaviruses, what kind of immune response they elicit, what the durability of the response is, what's the role of, of cellular immunity or humoral immunity in long-term or short-term protection. If we had any of that information, we would be in a much better position to uh, rationally formulate vaccines to make a difference here, here. In, in global health. And, mm. you know, there was no prioritization for it. Yeah. So, yeah. so, Ralph, I, I, I'm sorry. I think that's one thing that I've learned very much during this whole thing is how many open questions we could have or should have answered before. Um, do we have any idea of how long RNA persists um, for some of those other viruses? Because that seems to be this question of RNA persistence versus viral persistence um, that people are wondering about. I wonder if, if that's something we could have learned for other viruses. A, a guy named uh, Pierre Talbot had, um, who was very interested in the role of the potential role of coronaviruses in central nervous system mm -hmm. disease, um, did PCR, RT PCR on uh, autopsy specimens from the CNS from a large number of patients and found uh, many people had uh, human coronavirus sequences in the central nervous system. <laughs> Were they doing anything? No, he couldn't really correlate it with like uh, any kind of uh, chronic um, neurological disease manifestation, but they were there. And so we don't actually know how long, at least I don't know how long, the contemporary human coronaviruses persist following an acute infection. RNAs, there are, were, RNAs are a real problem. Yeah, it's <laughs> everywhere. Right. Problem. Yes, right. it's everywhere. <laughs> Uh, there were human there there were human challenge studies done in the seventies, I think, and maybe even the early eighties. So, um, yeah. Ralph, can you imagine a, a a vaccine development program that still allows for morbidity but prevents mortality? Like you have, for instance, the developmental programs right now for malaria. 
for malaria vaccines, they're not trying to prevent infection any longer. What they're trying to do is keep children from dying from malaria. So even though they catch it, they don't die from it. So this That's could save a lot of old people, perhaps. Yeah, I'm partial to old people. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> So, that, I mean, that's the way the flu vaccine works, right? It, yeah, it, it's supposed its to. Its basic role is to knock down titer to the point that, and disease manifestations to the point that you have a mild disease, but you don't die. Exactly. And I think most respiratory vaccines are going to be falling in that same category. So that will be fine. Um, and and these vaccine trials that are being done are, are going to be looking at multiple endpoints. Um, so they will be, they'll, you, you vaccinate 30,000 people with your vaccine that's already proven safe and, and raises antibodies in your phase one and phase two trials. And then and then you see how many of those 30,000 versus the 30,000 who got a saline shot um, develop um, COVID-19. And you're hopefully you're testing these people regularly to see who gets infected as well as who develops symptoms. Yeah, and I think, so I, so you, I, you would hope for it. I mean, ideally, you'd get an endpoint where you can't even get infected, where you get sterilizing immunity. But I think if we get a vaccine where um, it's just protective immunity, you get infected, but you don't get very sick, um, that's going to be counted as a win. I would say that's a huge win. Yeah. Um, I mean, it certainly takes my concern level from being high to low as an, yes, as an right. elderly individual. So what I do you also, think about... Uh, Younger people, what's the age that you're going to start vaccinating? Because you've got a lot of serious problems in, among young children that catch this infection. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I, I think we need to learn more about these um, uh, new inflammatory manifestations that are occurring in children. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, that that the prevalence of that, the um, the risk associations that are associated with that, I think need to be looked at. And um, that's probably going to drive some pretty pretty um, interesting discussions at the FDA and other health agencies that make those decisions about whether they're going to make this a childhood vaccine or not. Right. Is and uh, I'm I'm certain the companies would love it to be a childhood. <laughs> I'm vaccine. sure they would. Uh, is there an animal model for Kawasaki disease? Not that I know of. You know, the vaccine. I've never even heard of it before this outbreak. Vaccine, current vaccines are not being tested in children. They're being tested in I adults, realize that. right? So you can't use right them. Now, right now, it's healthy adults. Yeah. So the, I mean, I, th I think, again, one of the things we desperately need here are animal model systems in the most vulnerable um, hmm. settings. Right. So we, we definitely need to be testing these vaccines in old mice or old primates. It's harder to get old primates, mm -hmm. pretty easy to get old mice. Um, and um, so I think that's a real priority. And then I think we have to do vaccines in, in really young animals, but I, you know, we need a model. Otherwise it's pretty easy to make a, a vaccine work in a young animal that's sure. healthy. So, um, so, so speaking of models, you you have a bioarchive paper on a, a mouse model where you modify the virus, right? So, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, I wanted to say one thing about yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Dixon's comment about where are we going to test the vaccine, sure. and right. uh, the current idea is to use the NIH um, HIV vaccine trial network, which has um, trial sites all over the world. So, um, and one of the real benefits of the, even though we'd never have successfully made an HIV vaccine, what it did teach us is what human immunology we want to measure. So system serology, neutralizing antibody titers, all kinds of things, T cell responses, all that functional T cells. <laughs> yeah, what, yeah, I heard of them. They, they, they do more than one thing, right? That's a, they do. Poly Polyfunctional. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they go out and they get soft drinks and hamburgers at the same time. They, they make multiple cytokines, you know. So they're, they're making both, you know, cookies and pie. Cookies. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best description of polyfunctional T cells I've ever heard. <laughs> so anyway, I, I just think that the, the way the trials are being set up, they're going to measure everything that, that we can do. And, you know, even again, the, the 
even that we did not succeed as of yet to make an HIV vaccine. I mean, the gift that that science has given to the rest of the vaccine community is incalculable. So we'll go back to the mouse model now. Sorry. That's a good point, though. I, I appreciate That's that. a really good point. I, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't really appreciate that. All I could appreciate is that none of the vaccines for HIV have worked, but the network is great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it, the, the long, there's a long-lasting impact there that we need to um, acknowledge. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of our mouse, and so the problem with SARS, too, is it doesn't grow in a mouse, can't use the mouse ACE2 receptor. Um, it's pretty easy to model at least four or five different mutation sets that you could put into the receptor binding domain of SARS-2 so that it can use the mouse ACE2 receptor. So in this particular paper, we introduced two changes, um, one of which we knew uh, interacted with a specific residue that was variant in between mouse and human ACE2 molecules. And the other residue was a proline right next to it. And we just didn't like the idea of a proline next to it. So we changed it because, well, we could. And so we did. <laughs> <laughs> It's a general rule. If there's a proline there, I just don't like it. I don't know why I don't like it. I got to move it. Uh, Prolines are kinky. Get rid of them. (laughs) I don't want any kink in my protein. Uh, So so we made those changes, and that virus could now use the mouse ACE2 receptor, and it grows from zero in a mouse to 10 to the 7th in a mouse. Uh, But it doesn't produce much uh, in the way of serious disease. Um, it will cause a little bit of a clinical disease outcome in an older mouse that's a year old. Uh, so it's showing, it's beginning to show the age-related disease phenotype that we'd like to see. Um, and so that's what that basic okay. paper is about. And then we have systematically been working on that uh, ever since to make a full mouse-adapted strain that is lethal in young and old mice. Mm-hmm and captures all of the disease phenotypes that we would like to see. Uh, one is the age-related disease phenotype. Yeah. The second is acute respiratory distress syndrome and ARDS-like phenotype in the lung. And the third is we'd like to see a coagulopathy develop in those animals. That's and the best use of a gain-of-function thinking process I've ever heard. It's all good. It's all good. Do, do you see any difference between the male <laughs> and female mice? <laughs> um, good question. Hey Sabra, <laughs> right? I liked that episode a lot. <laughs> that, that was that was she was great. Not with the um, not in the bio archives paper that we published, but um, there is a sense that that might be occurring in the new mouse adapted strain. I, it's subtle. The better approach to do this is to use a, a different mouse called the collaborative cross mouse, where you have genetic, um, mm-hmm. in essence, a genetic resource that captures about, about as much diversity that exists in, in human populations. And when you start infecting those mice, you'll find uh, some lines will have a big difference in, this is based on SARS. I haven't done it yet with SARS-2, but obviously we will. You had to have a mouse-adapted virus that was good enough to work with before you actually did these experiments. But in some cases, you can see clear differences in males and females in the collaborative cross mice. And then uh, on top of that, uh, when we've done quantitative trait loci mapping, we have sex-related traits that we can map as well in those animals. Mm -hmm. So they're clearly, at least for the group 2B coronaviruses, mostly using SARS and a SARS-related strain called uh, HKU3, uh, which is, if you look at the tree, they're on different branches far apart. And so when we did studies in the collaborative cross, we used two different, two diverse strains so that we could look for common traits across the family. Uh, you can find sex, sex uh, uh, regulated loci. So in your studies, are you planning on also um, taking a cage full of mice that has no virus and throw in a mouse that has the virus and see how f- at, at which stage during the infection in the mouse that you gave the infection to, are they now infectious for the rest of the mice in that cage? Uh, we will certainly do that experiment. We haven't done it. We've done this experiment with SARS. And uh, we've actually done this experiment with the collaborative cross. So we, we took genetically, um, we had uh, uninfected controls in the same uh, cage as infected animals. And using, I think it was well over 500 mice 
that had genetic heterogeneous backgrounds, we were not able to show transmission of SARS really? from an infected to an uninfected animal. I'll be darned. And so that's actually a really important point that I forgot to write into that paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's still it's a preprint. It doesn't Robert, sound it's still a preprint. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good. We haven't submitted it yet, so, so hey, but thank you. Fix that. <laughs> That's quite all right. I was not a reviewer, by the way. I was not a reviewer. <laughs> I'll um, put so your initials in the acknowledgement, but they're going to be wrong. <laughs> It's going to so, be something um, like CF or something like no, that. No, no. Right? Northern New Jersey, NJ, <laughs> NJ. Yes. I don't spell very well, so I, I'll do my best. But. Um, so, I mean, that, that would suggest that maybe it's not um, maybe it's not currently the best transmission model, but it sounds like it could be a good pathogenesis model. Right. So, um, so we don't know with SARS-2. So SARS-2... Um, there might be more replication in the gut. There may be fecal oral transmission that could occur. So we need to look at that. Uh, typically, um, the model systems that could be developed for transmissibility would be the ferret or the um, uh, guinea pig would be the two mm -hmm. best models. There's, could you use there's, cats? <laughs> cats would be good models, but they man, you got to be, you gotta be good. Come on, you can't use them. <laughs> I would say, you know, they, they don't cooperate. Yeah, either. they got no, no, teeth. No, they, they were actually prevented <laughs> from using them in research now. PETA has made a, a, a demanded that NIH no longer approves of any grants that use cats as their or host. Hmm. I that didn't know that. started from toxoplasmosis research. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yep. Maybe they could use minks. Minks would. Well, it's yeah. kind of, yeah. And yeah. you get coats yeah, actually, out of it afterward, right? I don't know if we're going to get to talking that for story. coats. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, they have teeth. Well, what, are you, what are you doing with your controls right now? <laughs> exactly. I don't know. Yeah. They, have, they have teeth, I don't though. think, yeah. not minks. I don't think so. So, I, But I think uh, certainly ferrets or guinea pigs. Yeah. Um, I don't have any doubt that we could do it if we put energy into it. And so somebody's going to do it either in Europe or the United States to try to build a transmission model. And, and I think... Now that I re now that you mentioned that uh, Yoshi Koch has already demonstrated, I believe that the, you can get transmission in a ferret mm. from uh, yeah. two animals that or at least their nose can come in contact. Right. But no, and there's but there's been a um, a somewhat uncontrolled experiment going on in the Netherlands right now that is that's in mink, yeah, mink. related animal. So the uh, but the ferrets and the guinea pigs do not develop serious disease either, right? Th they don't. Um, I think that's probably f you. You can probably use um, serial passage experiments to solve that problem yeah. if you want yeah. to. Yeah. So uh, don't you think it relates though to the cytokine differences between those animal species and humans? Because most of the pathology from this appears to be after the viral infection is gone, and the sequelae that happens afterwards is what we're mostly worried about uh, in terms of full recovery. Um, do we have an animal model like? The humanized mouse, for instance, does that express all of the uh, same cytokines that humans uh, express? And I don't think it does, actually, does it? Well, the problem is you can't infect the ciliated airway cells or the alveolar cell, uh, type 2 cells or type 1 cells in the lung right. in those models. It's, um, so it's not it, – and it would actually need to be done – you'd need to use that model in context with a mouse-adapted strain that could actually grow in the lung to see if you could – that's another good idea. I'm going to have to write these down. <laughs> I need to talk to Victor uh, at UNC about his uh, humanized mice. My collaborative fees are very low, by the way. I've well, right, right. You're just giving away ideas. But right. I, I assure you, by the time we hang up, I won't remember they were your ideas well, no, at all. No, come on. I listen. <laughs> well, you can come back and listen to the episode again. Right. <laughs> oh, darn. It's on tape. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Ralph, there were a couple of things about this uh, model paper that interested me. Um, uh, I, I found it interesting that there's a, a difference in the phenotype, if you like, of the infection. If you take regular human SARS-2 and infect a mouse that's got the human ACE2 receptor on the one hand versus the... Uh, uh, mouse receptor adapted SARS-2 in the regular mouse. So right. what's going on there? Why? I mean, is it, is the human ACE2 receptor not expressed with the proper distribution or something in the, in the transgenic mouse? All those original models were done by um, straight um, 
transducing the human ACE2 gene into the mouse. And so it went in wherever it went in. Um, and then on top of that, um, I, I, I needed, I would need to look at the paper again. Sorry, I'm forgetting the genesis of the mouse model since it was actually made around 2009, not, not recently. But I believe we did, we used ES cells, which is in one genetic background, and then we had to back cross it into B6. So it's not even fully back crossed in terms of being isogenic for the backbone. It's kind of a mix. Now we've genetically mapped all that stuff. So we have all that information on the mouse model, but um, it's a quirky model. Uh, you get a, a, the ACE2 expression was driven from a lung promoter, but in reality, it did not only, it expressed in almost every tissue we looked at. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you infect with that virus, you end up with systemic disease. And um, ultimately, the animals die from encephalitis if they're going to die. And that's happened with every model that's used this same approach for both SARS and MERS, except for the model that the Chinese published in Science, where they said they had a lung-only infection with no spread to other organs. However, when you look at that model, uh, by real-time PCR, they only found 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th genomes. So they must that model must grow to 10 to the 3rd or 10 to the 4th in the lung. And um, if it's growing uh, at really low levels, uh, you won't, you may not have that spread event occur into the brain. And that's certainly the case. And, and even in our mouse model, that doesn't happen in every single animal. So I'm not a big fan of that human ACE2 mm, transgenic correct. model. Uh, I would much rather distribute mouse adapted strains that are lethal so that everybody's working with the same thing. And there were, uh, there was a couple of things that, uh, a couple of other things that struck me. First of all, I, I'm blown away by the fact that we can do the modeling that allows you to say, oh, if I tweak these couple of amino acids, I'll change the receptor specificity. I mean, it's easy just to shrug that off, but that's remarkable. I mean, that's just amazing. It's even more rem remarkable when you know you can do it four or five different ways. Well, that's, <laughs> that's that cool. touches on my next question is because the, <laughs> the one that you came up with now still reacts with the human receptor, right? Even though the yes. human virus is completely specific for the human receptor and doesn't touch the mouse receptor. Yes, it, although right? it, it grows to a little, uh, a slightly reduced, uh, a reduced titer in um, primate cells. Mm -hmm. So it's not like those two residues that you changed are the whole story. No. Uh, okay. There's, there is a, a series of really interesting papers that would be uh, modeling that would provide tremendous inf insight into how um, group 2B coronaviruses move between ACE2 receptors by making that whole set of, of different virus uh, uh, mutants and then studying not only how well they interact with different receptors, but then also asking the question, when you uh, fully, you know, will any of those be fully pathogenic? And if they're not, how will they evolve with additional passage? Will any of them develop additional mutations in the RBD to, and how, and you know, how that all models, um, I think is quite fascinating. I but go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was hoping that two amino acid changes would block interaction with human ACE2 because then it wouldn't be a BSL3 virus anymore. <laughs> I was hoping for that too, but that uh, <laughs> it actually ah. didn't didn't say it was going to happen in the models. Yeah, um, it may well be that I don't actually doubt that we could do that. Mm. I hadn't thought of that idea either. Actually, just to fully gen change, <laughs> we, we come as a team. <laughs> you, you can just acknowledge Twiv. You know, I'm the, doing uh, a lot of work. You guys are really causing me all kinds of. Problems. <laughs> oh, I got to write this down. I got three I, things I got to do. I have now. another question. I have another. Let's question stop this thing I, right really now. Like Let's stop quick. <laughs> one. I've got some experiments I could do if it was BSL two. <laughs> so I want to know if you've ever tried the experiment in cell culture, at least, to block all the ACE two receptors and see if the virus could still get in in another way, like pinocytosis or something else? Uh, the short, the, the long, at least with SARS and MERS, the answer is no, it's not getting in any other way. Okay. Now, there have been a couple of papers of um, and, um, different ligands that contribute to entry. Uh, but when you look at the data, it's like two to fourfold increased 
um, um, infection rates in terms of the number of cells, and they're always doing it in the context of the receptor. Mm. So when we've actually had a full ACE2 knockout mouse that we've tried to infect with SARS-1 SARS that right. was uh, <laughs> using the SARS mouse adapted receptor, and that, there's no growth in that animal. None. So, okay. zip. Oh, well. Now, I think you could probably do it, but um, we're not going to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you uh, well, the work you mentioned up a few minutes ago about using collaborative cross mice and developing a, a model for more serious disease, I guess that'll be done when we talk to you next month. So, Looking for <laughs> I don't know if it'll be done next month. <laughs> it would have been done, but you guys gave me like a half a dozen experiments. I yeah. go, how about <laughs> So I mean, an, another thing that struck me, uh, Ralph, is that uh, in this section about uh, seeing if you could um, uh, use these mice as an immunization model. Uh, you say in the you say utilizing a mm. Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus replicon particle system. You vaccinated the mice; they turned out to be uh, immune. And I just went, "What? Wait, uh, a vaccine?" Um, and then I I looked up. You, that's referenced. Is that no? That's um, in the paper. Yeah, it is in the paper. Is that uh, is that uh, being platform being pursued as a as a vaccine candidate um <clears throat> the the v replicon vaccines i think got um licensed by harris pharmaceuticals or harris something another and have made um uh, a, a pretty good profits in making animal vaccines okay for like porcine epidemic diarrhea virus and other maybe other um, pathogens of swine. And so um, they've provided some levels of protection. It's lactogenic immunity against the swine coronaviruses, the, the vulnerable populations of the newborn piglets. And so if you don't generate good lactogenic immunity, you don't protect the piglets. So, but it doesn't, you know, induce some lactogenic and it provides some protection. So it's been an effect, uh, somewhat of an effective vaccine. Um, the development of those vaccines for human use um, really have kind of fallen to the wayside, which is unfortunate. And part of it was because they were BSL-3 pathogens. We right. re-engineered it using this attenuated vaccine strain of VEE that was used in a large number of patients, but it had some uh, secondary um, mm -hmm. deleterious effects in terms of headaches and things like that. So it didn't make its safety metrics but uh, when we build replicon particles in that background, you can use them on BSL-2, and they're non-select. And so uh, it's much easier to work with them, and uh, that's why we use them in this context. Um, we've also been uh, working with the NIH and various groups to test, um, I don't know, maybe four or five different vaccines, um, vaccine formulations, both with the um, replica replication model that's in the paper and um, for the full lethal model, uh, both in young and old animals. Uh, the replication model data uh, has been submitted to a journal and should come out on BioArchives today or tomorrow. I don't know. It's been submitted to BioArchives. It's um, Barney Graham's group is leading all this work. It it's out. Includes, yeah, it just came out this morning. Did it come out today? Okay. Yeah. So it included Moderna vaccines and also um, the uh, S2P recombinant protein vaccines that his group has been sort of pioneering. And um, it protects in those setting, settings. And the uh, second generation tests in young and old animals are coming along. Um, I think some animals actually have been challenged this week to look in young and old animals to vaccine efficacy with the lethal challenge under conditions that I think we really are testing them in a vigorous model. And if they work, I'll be impressed. Awesome. Yeah. yeah this, cool. um, the paper, the bio archive that came out today is on the MRNA vaccine, MRNA 1273. And is that using your mouse adapted variant, the two amino acid? Yes. Uh, 
part of the papers with MERS using a lethal MERS challenge. And so that protects and, and that is a rigorous model. The animals develop full-blown ARDS around day five through seven mm -hmm. and um, will lose 30% with about 30% body weight if you don't um, use humane euthanasia at an earlier time point. And a significant percentage will die, and so that's a pretty rigorous model. And the uh, the vaccines worked in that model for mm -hmm. MERS, which was, I think, very encouraging. The next step up in terms of um, strenuously challenging the um, the performance of the vaccine is to test it in older animals, about a year, year and a half out. And if the vaccine works in that case, then I'm going to be really impressed. Mm. All right, so that's ongoing, right? Yeah. So th do you think this, uh, in this paper, you showed that the mRNA induces neutralizing antibody and CD8 T cell responses. It was protective. But the, as you say, these are young mice. So you're reserving judgment until you see the, the effect in older mice, right? Yes. I guess I, I don't know if I'm old school or just a grumpy guy. I might just be a grumpy guy, but I think too many scientists um, who are working on um, countermeasures um, want to use models that prove that their approach is correct. And I want to have models that try to prove that their approach is going to fail. I think you're right. I yes. think you are absolutely right to do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Too many. Grumpy people. is good, Ralph. Grumpy, like grumpy is good. We You're like. You're in the right place though. for grumpy. Yes. Yeah, we are I'm surrounded the, by grumpies. It's all yes. those Jersey people. Why are we all grumpy? Yeah. We've been well, called grumpy many times. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but the the, uh, the same. This Moderna. This is the Moderna vaccine, right? Twelve seventy three. Yes. That's in phase two, correct? Already. I don't know if phase two has started yet. I it, don't know that it's, it's close. Started. Yeah, I think it's. I think July is when the phase two of that and J and J, and there's a third one that are all going into phase two, at least in the U.S. All right. All right. There are five that the NIH is trying to move forward uh, in parallel. Mm -hmm. A little, some in parallel, some will be, be will follow after. Um, but the um, right now, there's this massive behind the scenes effort to develop um, robust assays that meet FDA standards for the vaccine development, mm -hmm. not only for system serology, but neutralization assays, serology assays, you name it. They're trying to develop, um, mm -hmm. demonstrate quality control, get well-developed SOPs, make sure that you have um, good rigor and reproducibility in the assays across different um, individuals who will be doing the tests and um you know this is actually quite an extraordinary effort mm -hmm. that most people have no idea that's occurring yeah I but, that, heard. but that's i mean that's a critical piece of the infrastructure of doing these types of trials and getting a vaccine we can be uh, basically you're laying the tracks down as the train is coming along i guess that's right that's right and, and, the, and all of the, this has to be in place by at a latest would be September 1st. And the train has to unload its cargo on uh, November 4th. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> why, I'm sure, that, I'm why, sure that some would like that to happen. Why do you yeah. say September 1st? Because that's November when, 4th. No, no. You, November 4th. But Ralph said September 1st. The assay, yeah, you did. You did. did I say September 1st? Yeah. I didn't. Yeah. I think you said oh, that the assays have to September be in place. That's right. That's right. The assays have to be in place because the samples start arriving. Oh, I see. So phase right. two phase two samples. You have to go, I know. I know it's an hour. Yeah, I have another call. No worries. Okay. So can we get you back next month? Because I barely scratched the surface. Sure. I enjoy talking with you guys. are a lot I'm of fun. Glad. And, I, That's and good. I get great ideas. And it's you like, want to find okay. out how our experiments are doing. Come on. I can't, I can't <laughs> wait to lab meeting on Thursday. I'm going to yeah, say exactly. I came up with all these great a ideas. Club. Don't forget journal club next week. <laughs> I, I apologize in advance to all of your grad students and postdocs. <laughs> Ralph, they will have they will have heard the episode and know that you didn't right. <laughs> have the idea. Uh, no, 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 no. It's, it's, okay. it's a new world. I'll convince them. All right. Ralph Barrick, UNC. 
Thank you again. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Ralph. Thank you. I'll stay safe. Thanks, thanks Ralph. Bye-bye. Pleasure to see you Take all care. again. Yeah, but I had a bunch so, of other papers and we didn't get to, but we'll, we'll reserve them. Uh, it's so much fun talking to Ralph. That's just, yeah. Uh, he's yeah, it's really terrific. Great. Well, he's, he's yeah. terrific. totally Very connected. Is, yeah. is he in the microbiology department at uh, University no, actually, of he's in the School of Public Health or Epidemiology so or something. So there was a, a man there. His name was John Larsh. When I was a graduate student, John Larsh was a big luminary at the School of Public Health in North Carolina working on trichinella. Mm -hmm. He used a lot of rats in his research. Now, you were talking about using minks and using the fur. Well, John Larsh would cut the tails off the rats after he sacrificed them, and he would use them on a lure that he developed to go fishing for largemouth bass. <laughs> <laughs> they were terrific. He used to catch a lot of fish like that. That so, is a very North Carolina thing to do. It's I a like very that. North Carolina. Like what do you that. call that? Is there a name for that lure? Well, uh, the pork rind is what they used as their trailer on the end of the, it, it sort of makes a, a motion in the water, like a, an eel or a leech. Mm, very effective. So the, when the, when the tail relaxes enough, I guess you could knock the collagen out of it. You can get it to do the same thing. So it's it's quite it's quite a good repurposing of um, something that ordinarily would be discarded. Yeah. <laughs> so right. I just looked up the uh, Moderna study yeah. on clinicaltrials.gov, the uh, phase two trial. Uh, uh, you could say is started, but I don't think they've actually immunized anybody yet. They're recruiting. Okay. Uh, and it's going to be 600 people okay. with uh, 50 and 100 microgram doses. Yeah. In the, in the bioarchive preprint, pre it says it's begun. but And that's that's the that's phase fine. two. Phase two. That's they, the phase two. They already yeah. did a phase one where they had a, much, uh, they had a smaller group to make sure right. that it was. And I assume that these data in this preprint that we mentioned briefly are part of the uh, information that was used to approve the phase two, right? Mm-hmm. I would assume so. Yeah. Or maybe phase one even. Who knows? All right. Um, we have, let's do some email. All right, the first one, we'll, we'll have a little discussion around. Um, it's from Khadija. Is that right, Brianne? That's how I would pronounce it is Khadija. Okay. So the subject line of the email was, um, so we are not going to talk about race. Dear Twiv, I've been a longtime listener time pre-plague, but have doubled down in the midst of the pandemic to the point where I have nightmares of waking up in the ICU screaming at the podiatrist. Listen to TWIV, first 20 minutes, Daniel Griffin. I've launched, launched my own podcast, We Be Imagining, examining the intersection of surveillance slash policing, COVID-19, tech, race, and gender. I was overjoyed that our pod was going to be aggregated on the Columbia podcast website alongside TWIV but our arrival has been bittersweet. I didn't even know there was a Columbia podcast website and they Great. actually have us there. Amazing uh, miracles. You see, in, in fact, you see? happen. Acknowledged You're not chopped by, liver. You got uh, that? I'm ground liver. Uh, yeah. Acknowledged by Columbia. All right. Sorry. The Twiv suite of podcasts, collective silence on the racially disproportionate rate of COVID-19 mortality the racially differentiated police enforcement of social distances and global protests demanding justice for George Floyd, who recovered from COVID only to be brutally murdered by the police is deafening. The decision to open episode 624 with a white savior call to donate to an African charity as if there are not black people at your doorstep demanding a reckoning is shocking and words cannot express the degree to which I'm heartbroken by my favorite podcasts. Refusal to acknowledge Black Lives Matter. I have to say by Daniel's silence, even more so since as a clinician, I imagine he's currently attending meetings where racial differences in the impact of COVID are being discussed. This is why we're afraid to go to the doctor and drop out of STEM programs. Even virology is situated into a social political context. We cannot understand the spread of COVID-19 outside of the exponentially higher rates of infection in Rikers Island relative to the rest of the New York City area. I've always appreciated your commitment to science communication, but you are not only alienating your audience by refusing to address the intersection of race with COVID-19, but those who stay are receiving a distorted view via this omission. I suggest you invite a black epidemiologist on your show and someone like my good friend Dorothy Roberts, who examines bioethics from a sociological lens. I'd be willing to collaborate on an episode with you if that's something you may be interested in. Either way, I've really enjoyed so much 
of your show, and I'm hoping you will remediate this glaring silence with more than a solidarity statement and work to integrate critical race theory into the show by inviting more black and of color guests. All right. So this, you know, often on TWIV, we have to be re- reminded to do something we need to do. I'll, I'll never forget when the, uh, when uh, it was some Ebola outbreak years ago, we just ignored it. And someone wrote and said, Hey, you need to talk about this. This is your stuff. And yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so this is the same thing. And, um, uh, so I reached out to Khalija and I said, let's uh, arrange Khalid- what? Khadija. 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 My apologies. Um, and so we will uh, put a show together as suggested here. Um, and um, and this this letter with the links, including the link to this, uh, well, it sounds like a really interesting podcast that we'd be imagining. Yeah. Um, it, that will also be in the show notes. Um, so definitely something to check out. Um, I just want to thank Khadija for this letter. Yes. Um, I think that it's really important to point these things out. Um, I, you know, we've mentioned that this is something that we all sort of believe and sort of are surprised that we have to say. And I think it's important that people sort of make the point that we need to say it and remind us um, we might make mistakes as we have done in not mentioning this before. And thank you for um, mentioning it. And we will do our best uh, to improve as we go forward. Yeah, I mean, and uh, I have to point out now that we're doing video, if you look at the screen, you will see from our faces that we are a group that is likely to be blind to this issue. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm even aware that I'm likely to be blind of this issue. And yet there it is. It's um, uh, because our society is built to make it easy for us to ignore this. So here we are. Uh, we did. I I. We haven't completely ignored the racial disparities issue. I believe it was 606 where we, we had a bit of a discussion about the, the issue of structural racism and the, the mortality rates in COVID-19. I realize that's not really to your question, but <clears throat> there we, we have at least mentioned it. Um, but yes, absolutely, this is something that um, needs to be centered to a much greater extent. And I'm looking forward to the episode uh, that Vincent's going to put together with Khadija um, on that as well. So I just, uh, just add my yeah, yeah, sure. thanks and uh, yes. And uh, uh, sympathy or, you know, solidarity with this whole thing. And I only hope that uh, uh, what's going on lasts and is of long-term consequence. And I hope that we can uh, help make that happen. Yeah. We have uh- Yep. Couple of- I, I uh, echo those uh, sentiments exactly. Uh, I'm a person who actually grew up in the South as a small child, born in New Orleans, um, was made painfully aware of the discrimination uh, factor between uh, white communities and um, African American communities. And um, I, I must say that I that, that Alan has, has said it exactly right because I grew up. Uh, after that, in a town in New Jersey, which had virtually not one single black person in it. Hmm. So how would you ever get to know the perspective of someone living underneath the shadow of racial discrimination without actually contacting someone who uh, can give you a firsthand account of what it was like? And uh, that's all changed now. But of course, when I was growing up, that was my background. So I'm not making an excuse, mind you. But I'm just saying that uh, the insensitivity that appears to be there is lack of knowledge rather than a purposeful discriminatory attitude for most people who have never made friends with someone who has suffered through all of these things and arrows. That, uh, and in fact, that phenomenon of an all white town um, or a majority white or overwhelming majority white town is part of what we are discussing when we correct. use the term structural racism. That is exactly right. Because um, it's not an accident that you ended up in New Jersey, which is a state that certainly has, a, even then, I'm sure, had a diverse population, um, and yet we're in a segregated town. That's right. Um, this is, this that's, is the that's not done that we, randomly, by the way. No, that is, there, is, there is nothing accidental about this. No, not and, at all. Um, so so you, you grow up, and then you go to college, and then you learn. We are, we are products of this system. And, that's uh, right, and that's unfortunate. You know, and and Khadija, thank you again for bringing that up. Yes. And, and we will continue to discuss this and you bet. by the way any listeners who are upset about this discussion um there's an off button and you can just 
go because <laughs> this this does intersect the virology. This is still a virology no question. podcast. No question um, about it. And we need to whenever whenever it intersects other topics, we need to explore them at least to the extent that it's um, that it is relevant to this and and COVID nineteen. Very, very relevant discussion. Right. Absolutely. Things like resource availability and healthcare availability and other types of um, things that might be happening from having uh, less healthful food, or, you know, food deserts. And you can go on and on and on. Yes. All of those things influence what happens when you are infected with a virus. And so yes. you can't think about virology without thinking about those other things. You know, it's interesting. Khadija mentioned George Floyd recovered from COVID, someone told me, I don't know who, but at autopsy, he was still PCR positive. I saw that. So it, that ties into the discussion we were having with Ralph about persistence of RNA. Why? Mm -hmm. And I just think this happens all the time and we're just learning about it because of the tech, mm -hmm. right? And we're looking. But uh, can, uh, Brianne, can you read Margaret's uh, email? Please? Sure. Margaret writes, Dear Twiv, I know you like to keep politics out of the discussion and let the science speak for itself. At the same time, I listened with a sense of pride in my TWIV friends, and yes, I know you've never met me. As you talked back to the suggestion that Black people are more likely to be infected with SARS due to a vitamin D deficiency, on TWIV 606, one by one, you took down that specious argument. Here is an interesting development, a strike tomorrow, June 10th, I guess that was kind of a couple days ago, um, to shut down STEM for a day of reflection. Everyone is doing their part, and she gives a link. I'm doubting very much you can take this up on the show, but writing because I feel you are in accord. I love Kathy Spindler's diverse teams linked from the TWIB site, Vincent's devoting a lecture to the naming and recognition of Henrietta Lacks, and Rich and Allen's articulate explanation of why phenotype does not pre does not determine predisposition to disease in the Black and ethnic community on TWIV 606. Then there's the why of the lack of diversity in STEM. I've been thinking about it quite a lot and feel it's very hard in our country to get into STEM without a close mentor or family member to talk to. The dinner table is the thing. TWIV is a sort of dinner table conversation, but maybe a bit more diversity is in order on the guest list. With admiration, as always, Margaret. <laughs> All right. So again, thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. And diversity on the guest list, more diversity on the guest list is, uh, we'll work on that. Yep. Yeah, for yeah sure. absolutely. For sure. Important. There are quite a few people who would be really wonderful guests for us. And yeah. the, um, on the shutdown STEM topic, um, this, I actually, it came across my radar. I'm quite ashamed to admit I'm a science journalist and I should have been on more on top of this. I was not following it as closely as I should have, but uh, it came to my attention about two days before, like around the eighth, I got an email um, from nature that their, um, their embargoed press releases, they were actually delaying publication um, so that they wouldn't be publishing anything on the 10th. So mm. they sent a, a follow-up to their press releases. Oh, by the way, we'd embargoed these for release and you can still report on them if you want, but the papers themselves will not come out until the 11th because we're honoring this shutdown STEM event. Um, and I, by the way, we've also had a discussion on the TWIV Slack channel um, in which we shut down TWIV on the 10th. Yeah. Um, so there was going to be a, there was in fact going to be a recording session then, and Vincent took one of the canned episodes and released uh, on the following day. He took one of the canned episodes and released it um, so that we were honoring the event. And in the process, we also had a, a somewhat lengthy discussion about this exact topic and Khadija's letter and the whole conversation that that has started. Yes, and I know that um, one of the ideas for the shutdown STEM day was for people to um, reflect on these issues in STEM. Um, and so uh, it was a really nice day for me to be able to look at um, inclusion in one of the programs that I'm in charge of here at Drew and figure out how to make some changes. So I, I really appreciated um, the time I had that day and hope to make it something that happens more often. Oh, this is really interesting because, uh, you know, amid all the protests, uh, one 
a person like myself is likely to say, what can I do? What can I do? And here we have a bunch of people writing in saying, you can do something. Yeah, uh, that's right. Twiv can do something. You bet. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, although I have to say, <clears throat> all right, two things. Uh, yesterday we recorded Twim and we discussed a paper on academic racial inequalities because it's rampant there as well. And so you might want to check on that. Uh, I I attended a protest in my town on Sunday, a few hundred people in a park, uh, all wearing face masks, by the way. I was very proud of them, you know, uh, half uh, black and half white, or I should say half of color and half white, and they people told stories. And I have to say my daughter was involved in organizing this, and um, we went, and it was very powerful. People told their stories of how racism has impacted their lives. And these are people, kids mainly in our town who said, you know, they're scared to walk home. The police follow them home and so forth. So I think telling stories is a very powerful way. If you want to tell us your stories uh, about, you know, I would say racism you've encountered in academics because that's what we do here on TWIF. You're welcome to send them in if it helps. I know it's also hard to re relive them, so you don't want to do that. But some people obviously do. If any of our listeners are looking for more uh, of these types of stories to educate themselves, um, the hashtags Black in the Ivory um, and Black in STEM have been um, pretty active on Twitter. Um, I found them very eye-opening, and I sort of look at them and say, why would you do that um, to most of the stories about what people were doing? And so I've learned a lot. I also put, I will put a link in the show notes to a very nice uh, email from ASM uh, that came out earlier this week to members, really uh, putting, putting some good links in, but also saying, you know, ASM is part of this system and we need to do something about it. And I thought it was actually uh, very thoughtful. And you had a few resources as well, Rich, right? Uh, yeah. One of the things that gets talked about in this is, I mean, there've been a lot of uh, resources going around uh places people can educate themselves on the problem. Uh, one of my knee-jerk reactions to what can we do, what can we do, is vote. Um, and I know that that sometimes sounds maybe trite or lame, but I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, the uh, those who are in charge of governance have a lot to do with uh, the future of this problem. And so uh, it's important to make sure that the people who are sensitive to these issues and will do the right thing gain office. And the way that happens, and the only way that happens, is voting. And uh, so uh, in support of that, I put a link in here to, uh, I'm going to uh, use as my backup for this, Barack Obama, who wrote a nice little uh, bit about sustaining the momentum for change. And one of his messages is to vote. And not just in the big elections. He makes the point that a lot of this happens locally. Yes. And so being mm -hmm. involved in the community and uh, voting in local elections is every bit as important, if not more so, uh, than on the federal level. And, and the, go, go ahead. Um, when, you, when you go to vote, um, I would also suggest um, doing so with open eyes and noticing what it's like when you vote. Um, because this is, in fact, one of the other major issues. Uh, when I go to vote in my white suburban neighborhood, it's never a problem. I mean, there's there's not some big line at the even in the big popular That's elections. Right. I go and maybe there are two people ahead of me and I tell them what street I live on and I go and vote. Um, and I see the footage on the news from other neighborhoods just a couple of miles from me where people don't look exactly the same as me and they're standing in long lines to vote. And it's not because there's some shortage of paper and pens. It's a deliberate decision by particular people to limit the voting access in particular areas. And I live in a blue state where we're not supposed to be, you know, even screwing this up. And we are. Um, so keep it, keep an eye on that kind of thing and yeah, hmm. vote. And not infrequently, the uh, people living in disadvantaged neighborhoods, when they do get to the machines, they don't work. 
And that that was a recent uh, event that happened in a primary election of all things. Yes. And um, don't those machines get tested again and again and again prior to the time they have an election? Well, not the ones that they want to fail. That was not a political statement, by the way. That, that was, was actually the way it works. Yes. So the other uh, resource that I wanted to point out is a show that was broadcast some time ago, but you can stream at any time. Uh, it's a documentary by Henry Louis Gates Jr. called Reconstruction, America After the Civil War. Uh, and it, I think, is, uh, it. well, it's shocking, uh, but it lays down <laughs> what I think is the foundation of the mo the modern system of structured uh, racism. It describes how there was an effort to uh, build reparations after the Civil War and about how that, how that effort was uh, ultimately uh, turned around to um, uh, instill this structured racism into the society that, that we experience. And so it's a, uh, it's, uh, I found it a, a really compelling bit of history to understand how, um, how structured this actually is and how long it's been going on and where it came from. We so didn't Richard, get here uh, by uh, accident, and it's not going to end spontaneously. No, it's not. There's a, a statewide board of uh, regents that approves of all the textbooks for all the state-run right. schools. Sure. And, for instance, my son lives in Kansas, and for many, many years, they were just rejecting all the science books that said that fossils are the record of the rate of evolution for life on Earth. And, you know, all the fossil fish, by the way, come from Kansas. I want you to know that. So... <laughs> If you want a really good comparison of all of this, Rich, get a hold of a history book, high school history book from, let's say, Alabama. And another, I don't mean to pick out Alabama, but almost all the southern states have the same kind of history books, the way they represent the Civil War. And then look at all the northern states and the way they represent the Civil War. They're both wrong. Hmm. And for, other, for opposite reasons that they're both wrong. I mean, what you're seeing now, the renaming of military bases, the tearing down of statues, my, my solution to the statue situation is leave the statues up and replace the plaques with the truth of what that person really did. Robert E. Lee was a traitor. He was uh, guilty of slave trading, and that was against the federal law, and that's why they succeeded. And if you had that history underneath his statue, I'm sure that people living next to that statue would either want to tear the statue down or change the plaque. And my the my only the recommendation is, is when you are tearing down the statue, just, you know, wear hard hats or make sure, make sure nobody gets hit. <laughs> just do it carefully. You know, true, like this we, is true. And, this and is true. go ahead, go for it. You know, if you want to yeah, put somebody else yeah. on a pedestal, that's I fine mean, too. It runs so deep in culture that it's, it's difficult to know where the brainwashing starts. Yeah. Well, one of the important things uh, in this documentary is the uh, description of how a lot of that uh, Confederate iconography in the South was a deliberate effort to rewrite the history oh, of the yes, Civil of course, War and course, what it was about. Okay? And that's really Absolutely. good. I mean, we in New York City, we have Columbus Circle. And the statue of Columbus is standing right in the middle of that. So I Still, mean, he was not today? so, yes, it not is. so friendly not well, to all of those native peoples that he encountered in, in the Caribbean. <laughs> all right. Um, we have an email from Keith who sends a link to a political, a Politico article and wants our thoughts. He, it is an article. Suddenly, public health officials say social justice matters more than social distance. For months, health experts told Americans to stay home. Now many are encouraging the public to join mass protests. And I, I will say that I went to a mass protest in my town on Sunday. Everyone was wearing a mask. I was so impressed. And I think under those conditions, it's absolutely necessary. What do you guys think? Yeah, I go along with that. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, outside is the place to be. Yes. Um, and so if you're take reasonable precautions, good hand hygiene, wear a mask, uh, uh, maintain some sort of, uh, re uh, reasonable distance, uh, from other people. Uh, this, I would say that this time 
the uh, issues that have come up uh, are every bit as important as the pandemic. And I think we can do both of them at the same time. Yeah, I would agree with what Rich said. Um, you know, these protests have to do with um, people being able to live their lives safely. Um, and people being able to live their lives is important enough that we can um, do some socially distant mask wearing protests. Um, there are certainly, maybe there are some things that are not as important as staying home and wearing our masks, but people's lives and their ability to, to sort of live their lives in, the, in America, I think that's a pretty important. Here, here. This I, is, um, mm-hmm. yeah, so if it, I, I mean, it's important to point out that the masks are not magic. Um, that's not going to necessarily prevent transmission. And yes, if you go to a protest, you are increasing your risk of getting exposed to SARS-CoV-2. I'm there's there's no way to sugarcoat that. You that should is get true. tested afterwards. That is, yeah, you should you should monitor for symptoms. You should try to distance. Um, do what you can. However, um, I I disagree vehemently with this notion that um, somehow oh now is not the time for these protests. This is you know the, you got to postpone this. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny right. how it's never the time for these protests, isn't it? You know and. Right now, there seems to be a moment, and it is probably a unique opportunity in history for something to actually get done on a problem that has been extant for 300 years plus. Um, so, yeah, now is not the time. It's never going to be the best time, It's but there's an opportunity now. So, yeah. There's a risk involved. There's also a risk involved for people, depending on their skin tone, of being, you know, held down by the throat by police until they can't breathe anymore. Um, And on balance, I'd say that's a problem worth fixing. And if this is your one opportunity to fix it, and this is the way that we have to do it, then okay. Um, This is this seems like a risk worth taking. Uh, Of course, on the other hand, if you can accomplish some action without having to get with a big group of people, that's great too. Um, You know, try just try to minimize your risk. But I I am not on board with the notion that the pandemic should should preclude these protests or even that it's a mixed messaging from public health officials, which is what this Politico article is, is arguing that, oh, the public health officials should be telling people to stay home. No, these are both major public health issues, and we're not going to we we can't just say you got to set one aside that's at least equally serious. So I think one of the things that this article is doing is it's saying that uh, prior to this, there were protests uh, that were protesting against the shutdown, and uh, the perception is that people were saying, "Oh no, you shouldn't be protesting." Uh, because uh, you shouldn't be gathering in crowds and that kind of stuff. And now there's protesting uh, in the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter issue, and all of a sudden, that's okay. And I, you know... Not equivalent. They're not equivalent. Not equivalent at all. The the white people, the overwhelmingly white crowds who were who were turning out to protest their right to get a haircut and, and drink at a bar, that's not life or death. And they are not being heavily affected by these health disparities that we're talking about with COVID-19. They're not the ones getting their throats stepped on by the police. And so it was completely optional for going out to protest the shutdown. Um, whereas this, I, I'm not sure this is optional. I think this is, as I say, I think this is a unique opportunity that needs to be seized. And I, and I hope it works. That I agree completely with everything that Alan just said. And I think the other piece to remember here is that these are not two totally separate issues. Um, right. The health disparities um, are exacerbating COVID-19. Um, and so we can't say that um, we're thinking about COVID-19 only. Um, and thus we should igno- ignore some of the issues that some of our uh, Black community members are facing. These are interrelated issues. Right. All right. Uh, Dixon, if you scroll down, Owen, I would like you to read Owen's email. It would be my pleasure. Owen writes, Dear TWIV team, I listened to your podcast on my way to the hospital. 
where I work here in Melbourne, Australia. You asked for a haiku, and I am happy to oblige. It's entitled, Hashtag COVID. Today I trembled at the ways I touched, not yours, but my lips, eyes, nose. Yours in gratitude, Owen. Excellent. Excellent. Well done. It's a great, it's a great haiku. <laughs> really good. A right, couple of brevia. Uh, a paper just came out this morning. Sorry, guys. I can just summarize this quickly. Preprint bioarchive hydroxychloroquine proves ineffective in hamsters and macaques infected with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is from the Rocky Mountain Laboratories and it includes Emmy DeWitt, who um, was on TWIV. Gosh, I don't even remember. Last week, I guess. <laughs> right? I think so, yeah. <laughs> Talking about the non-human primate model of uh, TWIV that uh, she uh, works with over there in Rocky Mountain Laboratories out in uh, Hamilton, Montana, and uh, also involves a few other institutes. But basically, uh, you can give either hamsters or non-human macaques the drug prophylactically or after infection— they use the dose that's used for malaria or a higher dose uh, in hamsters. No beneficial effect on virus shedding in non-human primates, uh, prophylaxis or treatment. No reduction of virus shedding. No beneficial clinical outcome. So it didn't work. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, although we've seen some uh, trouble with the publications, there was that uh, sort of meta study that was uh retracted from lancet yes. mm -hmm. i have to say that uh there has been nothing in the literature that supports the notion that uh hydroxychloroquine is of any value and there are the the big one that was retracted was one so actually, a couple of studies um, that were connected to a company called Surgisphere. but setting that completely aside, what you see in literature is um, no solid data supporting hydroxychloroquine and some relatively small studies, but studies nonetheless, that were controlled that show that there's no benefit. So right. what we've got so far is pretty much that this is not going to be the answer. And they there are some large randomized trials that I believe have now been restarted. They were stopped mm -hmm. or paused after the, the Surgisphere papers came out because that seemed to answer it. And now we know the Surgisphere data were bogus. Yeah. Um, but those large controlled trials have now been redone, restarted and we should be getting uh, definitive answers from those relatively soon. And, and there are some risks that seem to be associated there, there with this are, There treatment. do appear to be some genuine risks associated with it. But as Alan said, there's still some in progress, some controlled trials. So we'll hear about those in a few months, most likely. Uh, we received a lot of emails about the mink infection of mink, farmed mink in the Netherlands. Tony Evert, and we'll read Everts because that's an interesting one. Uh, Mary, um, who else? Yes, that's that. And so basically, you know, in, in many countries, they farm mink for pelts. And, uh, you know, in the Netherlands, that's apparently going to be outlawed after 2024. No more farmed mink. That's good. Uh, and uh, recently, a, f a number of farms, I think four farms now, have been found to have infected mink, SARS-CoV-2 infected mink. Uh, they appear to have acquired infections from the, the farmers and their family, who in some cases were shown to have uh, documented SARS-CoV-2 infections. File a genetic analysis of the sequence from mink, of virus recovered from mink, shows uh, that they're separate infections and that they most likely came from the people. And there's also, um, the, some of the minks get sick. Some of them die, apparently, from infection. And uh, there's some evidence for mink to human transmission. Right. And so... As far as I know, now they're deciding to cull all the mink on infected farms to try and stop this outbreak. And if you and didn't understand what we were saying about minks earlier when we talked to Ralph, yes. this is what we were this alluding to. This is what we were referring to. Um, and since it's going to end in the Netherlands in 2024, and they're apparently they're one of the biggest um, producers of 
mink pelts in the world. Mm-hmm. There's uh, the Netherlands, China, and somebody else. Um, but um, since it's going to end in 2024, probably many, if not most of these of these mink farmers will just call it quits at this point because they've got to kill off their whole stock now. And yeah. why restart? And I don't know. And frankly, I was I was really shocked at this news because I didn't even realize there was that much of a market for mink anymore. Yeah, me too. I mean, who's who's wearing this? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, there is a market, as Pete I does, guess I, will clearly, tell you, yeah. most likely. Um, be surprised who's wearing mink. I guess I would be. <laughs> <laughs> well, this reminds me of the discussion we had, I think, even the first time that uh, Ralph came on. Exactly. As to whether exactly. there would be an animal reservoir yes. for spillback yes. of the virus. Uh, and uh, this looks, from what I can tell, as if mink would be such a category. So well, between between this and the ferret data and the data on cats and possibly dogs, um, you know, it's it's almost looking now like mm-hmm. there are um, mm-hmm. a bunch of mammals that this can. Yes, affect. very interesting. Yes. I wonder how many more can be infected. What else? Uh, I wonder if cows can be infected. Pigs. Yeah, maybe I, uh, chickens. Probably not. Chickens. Well, a couple probably of days chickens. a couple of days ago, for the first time in three months, I went rowing oh. and rowed under the Congress Street Bridge where the Austin bats hang out. Bats. Oh yeah. Ah. <laughs> now looking up at them and thinking not only about spillover but spillback. You're not going to see them the same way anymore. <laughs> no. So, so that's an interesting <laughs> question. Yeah, in in areas where humans and bats are close. So did you see the bats under the bridge? No, nah, it's daytime. This is morning. They're they're zonked. They're hanging out. Where are they I hanging just, out? I could I they're they're cracks oh, uh, okay. in the in the structure where they hang out. So you can't actually see them. You can smell them. Yeah, they're, uh, they're peeing on you it. as you go under it. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll bet you not all the bats are susceptible to this virus, though. Well, I was wondering about you know all this stuff going through my mind. Whether there's a species preference, whether uh, actually any of the American bat colonies have ever been surveyed for coronavirus disease. Questions for another episode. Well, do I think you we guys... should fund that kind of research, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Do you remember? Oh, many many moons ago on Twiv, we had uh, not not only Matt Freeman but Eric. His name is uh, uh, yeah. Who, oh. who did bat sampling in Maryland, yep. I believe. Yes. Yep. And they, they, they were looking for, they were doing metagenomic analysis, but uh, I don't know what they found in terms of coronavirus. They found other viruses for sure. Maybe Eric is still lift, l- listening. Maybe there's some other uh, 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 North American bat type people out there who can tell us whether. Uh, well, you had Peter Daszak on recently. He probably knows. Oh, yeah, they didn't say anything about Lin North Palm, America. I, I think he said that the sampling is not very extensive. Yeah, North, I think North he America. said there wasn't much sampling. Um, hmm. But if someone else is out there sampling, we would love to know about it. Yeah. By the way, so, you're, if you're wondering about the, the mink story, uh, it turns out that many of them are apparently asymptomatically infected. So, yeah. you know, it's a problem to have infected mink and they could transmit it to people. That's why they're calling them to try and stop. No, it, it sounds like a good animal model for human infection then because that's the pattern. Well, that's that what we here. said to, we jokingly said to, to Ralph. Maybe they shouldn't kill all the mink after all. But I'm not <laughs> sure they're uh, in. No, I think, and, I think uh, ferrets are probably going to be. And they have teeth. Sticks and they have teeth. You can't teeth, make a coat out of a ferret, Alan, don't no, you? No, know you that? can't. But they, but <laughs> Ferrets are already an established lab model, and they're closely related. And they have well, yeah. Similar. I was going to ask, what's the relationship between ferrets and minks? Minks look like just kind of a fancy ferret. They, yeah, they're, they're both weasels. <laughs> they're yeah, fancy ferrets. That's a good fancy title. <laughs> Ralph Barrick and fancy ferrets. All right, uh, Rich Condit, can you read Everett's email? Okay. Everett writes: A few weeks ago, I discovered your podcast on YouTube. And then the whole series of TWIB TWIB podcasts in Google Podcasts. First of all, I would like to thank you and your team for these podcasts that contain a wealth of evidence-based medicine data on viral infections and associated disease. I follow the podcast on COVID-19 with great interest. I am a veterinary pathologist. And he has a whole bunch of credentials. And would like to... DVM and PhD. Right. Uh, and, And would like to draw some attention to comparative pathological aspects of coronavirus infections in animals. More specifically, the role of SARS-CoV-2 in vascular slash endothelial pathology is not unique to this virus. Ooh, good. 
In veterinary medicine, we are aware of a coronavirus which causes severe disease due to vasculitis and or increased vascular leakage. Mm -hmm. In the cat and other felines, feline coronavirus may cause severe and fatal disease, which is which essentially is a result of antigen antibody complexes and associated vasculitis. This disease in felines is called feline infectious uh, peritonitis, peritonitis mm -hmm. abbreviated as FIP, and is caused by a coronavirus. There are two presentations of FIP, the form characterized by uh, granuloma, granulomatous inflammation in the thoracic and abdominal cavity, and the uh, exudative form characterized by fibrinous peritonitis and pleuritis. Central to the pathogenesis of both presentations is the occurrence of vasculitis due to antigen antibody depositions in the vessel walls, type 3 hypersensitivity reactions. SARS-CoV-2 is therefore not unique amongst the large group of coronaviruses that may cause vasculitis. In addition to this, I would like to draw your attention to diagnosed SARS-CoV-2 infections and COVID-19-like disease in the farmed mink in the Netherlands. These animals appear to have uh, been infected by Farm workers who have shown to be infected by SARS-CoV-2, the important question now arises, of course, whether these mink can then again uh, be a source of infections for humans. I would encourage you and your team to use this information in your excellent podcast on this subject. Kind regards, Everett. I think we've found another animal model. Yep. I, th I think so. Of course, now I'm sitting here wondering how much is known about some aspects of cat immunology yes, um, and oh. whether or not um, they see the coagulation uh, phenotype, but also whether this antigen antibody type three hypersensitivity response is happening in people. Well, it's going to be very difficult. Brianne, that is, your, diff that is your assignment for the weekend to read up on that. Right. I can do well, that. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be hard to get a grant from the NIH for this, though, because they're, like I said, they uh, banned cats in research. Yeah, yeah. So once again, let, 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 let me see if I've got this straight. This sounds like it's another sort of immune pathology. Yes. yes. Not, right. as, yes. We're not talking about the you virus right. infecting the endothelium or a it's viremia true. or anything like that. It's right. an immune pathology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And it would be an important immune pathology to understand um, if it were happening with SARS-CoV-2 as we're thinking about things like using convalescent serum and treating people with antibodies. Um, yes. If we did that, we would be inducing lots of those antibodies to bind to antigen. And we hope we would not get this type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. So... Uh uh, he this rolls off his tongue. He says antigen antibody complexes and associated vasculitis. I don't, uh, in my mind, being naive to this subject, associate vasculitis with antigen antibody complexes. What's the mechanism here? Um, there are a couple of uh, mechanisms. One of them is that the antibodies can actually um, trigger immune cells that are going through the vessels um, and start to lead to some problems there. Um, we also can, you also can see those antigen antibody complexes depositing in the vessels and then damage to the vessel wall as there's clearance of those antigen antibody complexes. Okay. So we had a cat, the cat's name was Ahab. Ahab died from this disease. Oh. We took it to the vet at Columbia and uh, he didn't know what caused the infection, but he knew it was infectious because you could take peritoneal fluid from that cat and put it into another cat that didn't have the infection, and that cat got it also. Oh. So Koch's postulates can actually be performed using this peritoneal fluid from the cat that's dying by leaky vessels. Okay, that's the reason why the peritoneal cavity actually blows up with fluid. Wow. I have yeah, to say that right. Ahab is a great name for a cat. That, is a that great was a name great cat, a cat, too. <laughs> Wonderful, beautiful tabby cat. It was just Aww. everybody's friend. And uh, I, I, I watched it die, and it was uh, painful to Aww. watch. I had, a, I had a cat named Stupid who died from feline uh, immunodeficiency virus. Wow. That was a tragedy. 
Wow, you I mean, guys. This is a uh, business for vets. You guys. We're not being very things. positive today. No, sorry. We're talking about <laughs> our cats. We, uh, we should do an episode on FIP, I think. I think that would be interesting. Yeah. Yes, that'd be that good. That'd be great. Yeah. I, I think it would be informative. Maybe, maybe get Everett on, or if there's somebody else uh, who's researching right. it. Um, yeah, there are people at Cornell who. Uh, mm-hmm. work so, that. Brianne, okay. isn't there a um, a glomerular uh, associated um, immune deposition of complexes that causes a vasculitis at that point also? Yes. Yeah, so um, sometimes you can see these complexes um, in the kidneys. Um, and you can get some kidney disease. Um, there also are times where you can see deposition in the lung um, right. and farmer's lung. Um, and there farmer's are, lung. and there are also, yeah, I don't know why it's called farmer's. <laughs> um, and there are also situations where um, you can actually see these deposit in the skin, um, and you can see uh, sometimes uh, rashes. You also can get these complexes deposited in the brain and in our virology textbook we have a ah. section on this and we say and this is this brain deposition is associated with mental confusion which i think is very funny because it's probably even so worse than that expl- <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> i thought i didn't have any more t-cells vincent <laughs> um well i think you you have probably some memory t-cells right Brian? but you can't make many new ones if you, you get infected you, you don't make new ones right you have yeah. some memory T cells. Um, your thymus is not making any, making very many new T cells. Uh, it's out of business. And your long bones are pretty hollow. Not completely hollow, as Brianne said last time, but they're pretty. We're shells of our former selves, Dixon. We are. We are. And birds have hollow long bones, too. And they do. They, but they have a whole other. Uh, yes. Yes. A whole other organ to deal with that. The one by the butt, right? The bursa? The bursa. The bursa. B for right. butt. Um, if we had to fly, Alan, we'd probably have long bones, hollow long bones yeah. too. Yeah. And wings. All right. Uh, I think the last thing we'll do here is, uh, well, maybe not, maybe one more. But uh, we had a series of emails from people who were confused about what WHO was talking about. <laughs> uh, last week they said, first of all, asymptomatic transmission is minimal for SARS-CoV-2. And then- then a, a day or two later, they walked it back. And so um, I want to just point out that back in February 24th, there was a joint WHO-China report on COVID uh, issued, which I downloaded and read. And there's a paragraph in it that says, quote, asymptomatic infection has been reported, but the majority of the relatively rare cases who are asymptomatic on the date of identification went on to develop disease. The proportion of truly asymptomatic infections is unclear, but appears to be relatively rare and does not appear to be a major driver of transmission, (laughs) which at the time I remember reading and thinking, that doesn't make any sense. I think it is driving, and the data certainly support the idea that it is driving. And remember, asymptomatic means symptoms are what you can feel. You. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love the video. (laughs) Signs are what other people measure. So you get a fever, you feel it, you throw up, you feel it, gastroenteritis. Those are symptoms. So an asymptomatic infection means you don't feel anything, but you you may have something you don't, you can't feel like some cytokines floating around in response to infection. That could be measured. That would be a sign. Anyway, Um, uh, does anyone have some insight on what happened? And a, um, a mild fever could be a sign instead of a symptom. Yes. Yeah, mean, I that's think they, why they go around taking people's temperatures because yeah, you can't just yeah, say, right. do you have a fever? Um, that's right. You know, that might be a sign. So this this whole distinction of asymptomatic versus pre-symptomatic is, it's really not a bright line there because if you're pre-symptomatic and then you go on to develop a fever of 99.2 and then it resolves and you have a little dry cough and it resolves, mm. were you symptomatic? I don't know. Maybe you didn't notice. Yeah, as I think Peter Daszak um, talked about that too. Yeah, and so so what happened to... here was one WHO official who's normally been, as far as I can tell, she's been quite on the ball. Um, she made a comment at a press conference that um, that you know asymptom truly asymptomatic spread is rare, and I'm sure she meant this in the very strict terms that we just discussed. People who are completely asymptomatic never develop any signs or symptoms, nothing at all like that, um, that may be rare. And it may be rare for those people to spread infectious virus. But 
the the notion that carried across because this was a press conference was oh if you don't have symptoms maybe you're not contagious no um that's that's not correct at all we have ample evidence that people without symptoms maybe they're pre-symptomatic um can definitely spread this disease i'm pretty sure that nobody showed up on their deathbed or came from their deathbed to go to the choir practice in washington where they infected dozens of people i'm pretty sure nobody Mm. was hacking up blood or you know staggering or around dizzy at the biogen meeting um but they can absolutely spread it so yeah this was a a very unfortunate statement that has now been taken back well and it got it got blown up because the press loves to uh you know Hmm. Uh, riff on any sort of uh, controversy. Oh, that's do you, that's not what you told us before. Well, and, and uh, because and and because, frankly, there has been a lot of back and forth um, for two reasons. One, because we're learning as we go. Yeah, totally. You know, that's fine. Um, and the story is going to change. And people who've been people who are good at this and good at the messaging have said. We don't really know, but we're saying this now, um, and we may change it later. Um, at the same time, there are also quite a large number of people on public positions who are making statements that they pulled out of various orifices, and they're just, <laughs> you know, they're saying what they want to be true. And so there's this, yeah, this right. stuff going on, and that's very newsworthy because everybody wants to yeah, know everybody wants certainty and so of course this got a lot of coverage because now you've got somebody who's quite credible saying something that seemed to contradict what had been said earlier has the story changed no nothing's changed yeah i'm really glad i'm I'm really glad that we're making the distinction here between asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic because that's sort of the key sort of place that there's confusion with this is that people are talking about asymptomatic um using very precise terms uh, that a public health official might think about. And lay people are hearing it and thinking about things like pre-symptomatic cases. So those are not interchangeable terms. They aren't the same thing. And there are are things we can discuss, you know, in, in a group of geeks like us or public health officials meeting and discussing this at a very high level where everybody understands those distinctions. But then that person walks out of that meeting and walks onto a stage and forgets that they're not talking to people who understand those distinctions and this type of thing can happen. The reason that this is important is that if it were if it were true that you could only be contagious when you had symptoms, then we could identify those people Correct. and tell them to stay home or they That's could right. yeah. isolate themselves. Okay. Yes. But if you can spread virus, if you are infectious, when you're not experiencing symptoms, and I don't care whether it's asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, then you can't do that and it creates a problem. All yeah. right. And that's definitely the case. Well, that's what I, Ralph Barrick said in the very first TWIV we had him on uh, during this outbreak, that this is the big difference between SARS-CoV-2 and SARS. Yeah. In SARS, you did not transmit until the peak of disease. And that was usually in hospital where they could contain it. And he said, this one is transmitting before disease of any sort, and that's community spread, and that's why it's a problem. So I, I think, yeah, there, there is asymptomatic transmission, uh, and there is pre-symptomatic transmission as well. This is not, every virus is different in terms of when it's transmitted. Ebola virus does not transmit until you have symptoms of infection. Which is and good from the from the infected person's perspective. There is no difference between asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic. Right. Yeah. Yes, of course. So the other thing that I've noticed when I've um, encountered the press interviewing for whatever reason is that they want a definitive answer. <laughs> yes, and they want it simple so they can explain it to their readership. And you can't give them a simple answer for this. There is no simple answer. Like for instance, when the patients that are the most sick. So they spend 22, 24 days in the hospital. They're given oxygen for three quarters of that time. They've finally recovered. They get sent back to their room. They still find that they're viremic in some cases. 
PCR. That, that was totally virus. unexpected. They're PCR-y, PCR-y PCR positive, yeah. Well, PCR positive. Well, the thing is, you're still going to have to treat them as though they're infectious. Well, that's the you. question that Daniel's yeah. been struggling with, you know. I know, you, but you, I, if you don't, and then they go out and then they infect people, then you're going to be in trouble. Well, there, I, I, a study did come out, and I'm not, I believe, yeah, we talked about it last week with Daniel, where they right. took patients and they asked, well, these PCR positivity, how often does it associate with infectious virus that we can recover in cell culture? And I think that, well, the numbers depend on the PCR load, but they only looked at mild cases. And both Here Daniel and Chuck said, we need to look at the seriously ill to see how long infectious virus persists. Exactly. That's really the key. Exactly. And that's not an easy experiment to do, but it should be done for sure. Yes, It's, it's even more difficult to explain to a lay readership. Yes. Um, I just want, so we had a number of people um, send in questions about this, and I wanted to point out Aaron's who said, your show has kept me sane for weeks. I'm forever grateful, and so is my husband, I suppose, for <laughs> keeping her sane. <laughs> keeping her sane. So I really like that. Uh, that's, that's a mom from Texas, uh, Rich. Uh, and then we had, a, we had an email from Anna, Sam, um, Mikhail. This Mikhail deserves one... Um, Answer here. You said if 40% of in people infected don't show symptoms, does that mean that the fatality rate is much higher than we thought? How do I reconcile the serolo serology prevalence stats showing about 10% prevalence and the idea that 40% of the people infected but didn't show symptoms? Well, it's 40% of infected people, but it doesn't mean that 40% of the population was infected, right? Right. Right. You're confusing the two there. Yes. Um, and then let's, um, and we had another one from Judy and right. finally let's read one more and then we'll wrap it up. And this is Alan's. I want you to read one, Alan. Uh, yes, oh, Rachel's, <laughs> Rachel's, Rachel's, uh, dear Twiff team. I want to thank you for the continued dedication of COVID-19, uh, related information. I work for Bharat Biotech, which is a vaccine manufacturing company based in India. We currently supply cl close to 750 million doses of vaccine per year. Not a small company. Um, currently, I am the project lead for three COVID-19 vaccine projects. Two of our projects are in collaboration with Dr. Kawaoka at the University of Wisconsin using the H3N2 influenza backbone. Another was with Dr. Matthias Schnell, Thomas Jefferson University, using an inactivated rabies vector. The third vaccine is a conventional whole virion inactivated vaccine that was isolated from a COVID-infected patient. COVID-19 research and vaccine development are extremely confusing with so much literature out there, but after hearing your podcast, it makes it easier to cut, the, cut out the noise. I am applying to Columbia Business School next year and look forward to meeting you all after our vaccines get licensed. Thanks again for your efforts and stay safe. Thank you. That's interesting to know from an insider, yeah. right? Yes, that's great. Stop I mean, by uh, to the TWIV studio. I think yeah. this is important to know that many countries are developing vaccines and here's a company with a high capacity so yes because we need to I, get uh, it to the, a lot of people we can't just get it to the people on the show no it's no. Not no we've fair. got to get it to everyone around uh, the world i will give my dose to someone else okay it's no problem the other day for uh, a different purpose i uh, counted up from the landscape document the uh, the living landscape document from the who on vaccines and counted 25 different countries Developing vaccines on five countries. Sure. Awesome. Now, and how many different uh, vaccines by those 25 countries? Uh, companies? There are, uh, I haven't looked at the latest count. Last I looked, there was about 140 different uh, companies or vaccines uh, that are, you know, under development. I think there were about eight that are in clinical trials. I'd have to look again. So one of the papers we didn't get to with Ralph is where they're looking at conserved epitopes among different coronaviruses and trying to design a broadly acting vaccine, which, of course, is what is being attempted with uh, influenza viruses, right? And right. Uh, I think that's the sort of thing that should have been done. Think of all this money going into vaccine development. A fraction of that, if it had been spent previously, could have prevented this whole thing. Yep. Just amazing. Here I got and it. We should uh, remember that for our, you know, what we do in the future. If we I, start doing some of these things now, maybe we can prevent the next pandemic that happens yes. later down the road. So, Vincent, maybe the title of this show should be "An Ounce of Prevention." Yeah. <laughs> uh, here it is. There's uh, ten 
vaccines and clinical trials, and another 126 candidates in preclinical evaluation. Amazing. So, and that's according to the WHO, that, and it's not necessarily all of them. I'm really looking forward to the data from these trials. I guess in, we'll start seeing them in September, I suppose, right? Because he said September 1 is when the yeah. samples start coming in. Uh, that's very. That's going to be a lot of fun. Should we have a betting pool? I bet on which, <laughs> which vaccine is going to well, work. There's, there's a really big betting pool on this right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's that called? That's that's called um, well the stock market. Stock market, market? and uh, also the <laughs> payoff federal budget will be and, enormous. Um, oh, the first one that shows results, the stock market is going to go through the yeah, roof. That's right? why this woman's coming to Columbia's Business School. <laughs> yes, right. It's a good school, right, Dixon? It's a wonderful school. All right, that's TWIV six two six microbe TV slash TWIV questions and comments TWIV at microbe TV. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Palmier is at trichinella.org. And the Living River, is it .org? I guess so, right? Yeah, and Parasites Without Borders, too. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. Parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thanks, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Pleasure. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas, with a really big increase in new cases of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. We needed to emphasize that. Always a good time. And, you know, I really look forward to just hanging out with you guys on not just Fridays anymore, but, and it's nice. Yeah, you know, this Zoom thing is great. I do like you know, where it. Where we can, I like the visual. I good. Yeah, I like agree. It. I agree. You know, for years, for 10 years, right, we did it without, yeah. but I think we might just keep it up and for guests this is it's really great. nice for guests it's really good now our sound is pretty good because we have good mics so that that's wonderful i'm gonna get a daylight balanced light bulb up here so i'll so, look a little less red uh, have you been okay. watching the news <laughs> have you guys been watching the news and and you see the backgrounds for all the newscasters yeah, yeah. You know, judy woodruff's background is the best what is that they don't change her flowers because they're right. not real <laughs> uh, really and actually what I read behind her you know you get yep. a, you get a flavor for what that person's life is like uh, except for vincent right now because he's in his office well i cleaned I like it up the, uh, it's all cleaned up <laughs> i like seeing all the pets in the background people oh yeah that's funny stuff that's right so we well, did uh, leave the office door open next time so the cat will maybe come <laughs> in. we did a <laughs> twin this week and jason shepherd is dog was on the couch behind him <laughs> sleeping the whole time <laughs> and then ori his cat would periodically jump up and walk over his keyboard <laughs> it was very funny. funny yeah people have their their pets all right uh, brian barker is over at drew university bioprof barker on twitter thanks brian thanks it was really great to be here um, i enjoyed our conversation a lot today yeah ralph is always fun and yes, informative. really good. i always learn a lot He's a good uh, Southern Jersey boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is from Southern Jersey. They said that on the very first time he was uh, on Twitter, a long time ago. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com on Twitter. Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I have the, the nice daylight here. Is you do, yes. You can it's, see it's, it's flooding in. Balanced. Sun is, sun is the just, side, you've got a great arrangement. The sun is not yet below the, the, the top of the window. So in a few That's minutes, true. it'll be really bright in here. But at home, I do have a daylight uh, lamp in front of me to because uh, that you've got incandescence there. I've got a window behind me, so I've got to have something yeah, up balance. in front, and then I've I just put a bulb that happens to be incandescent balanced, yeah, which yeah, is why that, that's okay. People don't mind. It's what you say that matters, right? I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.